hi guys firstly thank you for your time um thank you for coming i'm just going to share my presentation with you um frida if you let me know when you can see it Can everybody see that? Cool. Um, yeah, so thank you for coming, guys. I'm just going to give you an introduction to SEO. Um, SEO does have a lot of components, so I've tried to pack as much information as I can in here. Um, if any time you think I'm speaking too fast or if you have any questions, please feel free to stop me because I probably will just be talking at you for a long time. Um, so, yeah, so if you have any questions, just, just let me know. So what we're going to be going through today, I'll give you a little bit of an introduction to myself. Um, then we'll go into a bit about what is SEO, um, what does it mean? Because I don't know if many people actually know what the acronym stands for. Um, and then we'll go through the three main component, components of SEO, which is technical SEO, on-page content, off-site, and then we'll have a bit of a summary. So just to introduce myself, as Frida said, my name is Cara. Um, I am an SEO account director and freelance digital marketing strategist. I lead and direct SEO strategies. I'm actually self-taught in the sense that I was working in SEO without actually realizing what it was. That was probably about maybe 10 years ago. Um, and actually entered the industry eight years ago with my first job in Mothercare as an SEO exec. And I kind of learned on the job, but the actual kind of components of SEO and kind of what it is and how to go about it, I taught myself. Um, my background, or would I say my experience with all my clients, all of these logos you can see on the left, they're all past, um, present, or some of them are future clients as well, which I'm currently pitching for. Um, predominantly in the e-commerce background, particularly within retail, including luxury, and I also have experience within international SEO, including China. I did help um, Selfridges launch their website in China, which was very interesting. don't remember any of the Chinese that I learned, but I did know it for a while. Cool. So we're going to what is SEO? Cool. So um, SEO actually stands for search engine optimization, for anybody that doesn't know. And how Google works is they actually call themselves search engine bots. I like to refer to them as spiders, hence the diagram. So um, what happens is Google, the Google bot or the Google spider will kind of take its time to kind of understand all the websites that are out there. So it does this thing which is called crawling. And it doesn't necessarily have to be um, just a website. It can also be looking for YouTube videos, images, PDFs, um, content that you have on the site. And what it does, it will scan kind of the World Wide Web per se. Um, and it will kind of look and understand and read what's going on. And then it will say, oh, this is interesting. Maybe we'll put this in this bucket. So Google has basically a massive database, um, which is called the Google Index. So once it calls everything, it will look into their database and kind of categorize and I would say organize where they would place the website within the index, which is how you will see a Google search result. So anything on page one is obviously prioritized very highly within their index. And then all the pages going on from that would also be indexed, but at a a lower prioritization basically um, and this happens a lot of the time and the bunch of spiders that you can see in the bottom right corner there's this thing called a crawler budget so what google does it has a certain amount of um, budget per month per se that it will call your website so if you're constantly updating your website um, it kind of gives you i think it's around three million um, calls per second per month so it's, it's always kind of best to understand when to update your website and how often Google calls your site. The more active your site is, the more it will get crawled. But there is a time where you can use too much of your caller budget. Um, but we're going to a bit more of that. So within um, Google kind of crawling and updating its index, there is a lot of, um, a kind of a lot to go behind it in terms of its algorithm. So I've kind of pulled out the four main major updates that happened quite a while ago, but Google does actually change its algorithm around 500, 600 times, which makes my job very hard. Um, but it, it's, it's good in a way where it kind of, so I would say maybe about 10 years ago, how you would formulate an SEO strategy is a lot different to how you formulate it now. So um, in Feb 2011, there was a Panda update, which actually made sure that you had good quality content on your website. So a lot of the time back in the day, what people do, they would just do this thing for, called keyword stuff in where you would, if you wanted to appear for a particular keyword, say, um, I don't know, design addresses, for example, someone would just write a load of content on their website and just stuff the keyword design addresses all over the page and that would be fine. 
um, Google kind of cottoned onto that and understood what was going on. And then it kind of understood that actually you need to be giving quality content to people when they come into your website, not just um, kind of stuffing your page with a load of keywords that you want to um, appear for. And in 2012, there was also the Penguin update where if you have a lot of links pointing to your website, it is seen as a good thing from Google's perspective, because if you have someone that's linking to your website, you're kind of seen as um, popular. So kind of think about the popular person in school always had the most friends. Um, in website terms, it will be the fact that if this website is really great from the Google perspective, it thinks it's great because so many links are linking back to it. So if you write a blog post, for example, if someone thinks your blog article is really good, they may share it um, or they may um, write, a, write a blog post for themselves, but also link back to your website. So that's a really good way to also kind of increase your backlink profile. But in saying that, what people were doing um, back in the day, which is why they introduced this in 2012, was if you were on a forum, for example, people could just kind of um, spam the forum with their link to their page to get people to click on it. So Google understood that as well. So then they introduced that update. And what would happen is if you were seen to be doing that, you were penalized, then you would be dropped out of the index. So it's always good if you are going to kind of go after external links um, or kind of try and earn links, which we'll go into further in, in the slides, it's, it's best to make sure they're quality and you're not seen to be, you know, spamming. Um, and the other two updates are also just, you, you'll get penalties for them as well. But yeah, I just thought I'd let you guys know that there are lots of updates. Um, now what happens is Google, Google always names them animals, which I don't know why. I think the last one was a dinosaur update. Um, but they don't give too much information about the updates now, which is quite annoying. So these are the four ones that we know kind of what Google's looking for. Um, and a lot of the time now they just do a Google, Google algorithm update and they don't give you too much information. So you kind of have to figure out what's happening. Um, and then the ranking factors, we'll go to the next slide. Um, so yeah, so there's over 200 ranking factors that Google actually consider. Um, what a ranking factor is, is basically what Google kind of looks at and decides where best to place you within their index. So that could be something um, in terms of content, links, which is what I was just speaking about in terms of backlinks, social signals. So if you are being shared on the social um, platforms, that also does come into account now. It never used to. Um, page speed, so how fast your website is. Semantic markup, um, which is basically how best you organize the data on your website, which we'll go into in more detail. Um, image alt tags, H1 tags, all of these different component, component, components sorry, um, are kind of things that Google will look at to consider to rank your website. And if you're seen to not be paying attention to any of these factors, Google won't want to rank you above somebody else. Because basically how Google works is you want to be the one who shouts the loudest and the one who you feel actually I should be ranked above whoever your competitor may be. Um, and within that, it actually really all starts with understanding your audience. So depending what the nature of your business is or the nature of your website is, whether you have a blog, whether you have an e-commerce website, um, whether you just have an informational website, whichever the, whatever your website is, you have to really understand your audience because how Google works now, um, especially now more so than previous years, is they want to make sure that they're pleasing the audience. Um, and search has got a lot more conversational with people asking Google a lot of questions. Um, how to boil an egg is actually the top search term and it has been for like the past five years, which I think is really interesting. Um, but yeah, so depending on the nature of your business, not all of these three touch points will be relevant to you. Um, but category data just basically looks at how do you categorize your website? What, what, what is your website about? Um, if you just pick an e-commerce um, page, for example, you may have loads of different categories, whether it's women's, men's, kids, um, shoes, house houseware stuff whatever it may be but you have to understand the category category data that your website um entails to then understand what audience would be interested in these sorts of categories um client data is more just understanding the audience itself so who would kind of be your clients for your website and the search data is just to understand okay so taking those two first touch points into consideration what would these people be searching for and within that search data what would the keywords be that would that we need to kind of optimize your website for So yeah, understanding user search intent would then be the next thing that's important. So within those three touch points that I just mentioned, it would be, what are they thinking? What, what do you think they will be thinking in order to land on your website? So you kind of have to think in terms of the user journey. If someone's looking to buy a designer dress, for example, what would their user search intent be? Would it be um, just designer dresses in particular, or would it be maybe actually a red designer dress? Would it be a red designer strappy, strappy dress? Like how long tail and how detailed can it be? And just kind of understand all the touch points that you'd want to make sure that you want to be at the beginning and, and the end of the user's search journey and whatever they're intending to search for. 
So um, I know you've probably all seen Google before, but not many people actually notice the difference between the listings within Google. So um, how Google works is, like I said, it, it kind of provides an answer to the user search intent. So once you, wherever you Google, this is just an example of um, a client I used to work for, Tommy's, which is a charity for babies. Um, so the search term is baby movement has reduced. So within um, any search listing, Google is at liberty to kind of give you whatever result it feels is most relevant to the search term that the person has entered. So the top box is actually um, PPC, which is nothing to do with SEO, but it is another search channel. So just to give you a um, quick background on that, PPC is what you, you would pay Google to make you appear on that top part of Google and you kind of pay per click. So PPC stands for pay per click. Um, so there is a cost per that. So every time someone clicks on that particular ad, depending on how competitive the search term is, um, your CPC could range from between a penny to five pounds per click. So that means that any time, once you've been bidding on that search term, if someone does land on that um, particular ad, if it's five pound per click, then you're paying five pound per, per click. Um, Google doesn't actually like anyone that does my job because we obviously consult and show people how to appear on Google for free. Because you can, you can do a lot with PPC in terms of you can manipulate the search, the search engine and kind of bid on a lot of keywords that you can, whereas SEO is a lot more long tail, but it's, it's worth it. SEO is more kind of the holy grail and the foundation in terms of digital search space, whereas PPC, you can be quite reactive. So, um, for example, if I start a new website and I wake up tomorrow and say I want to appear um, number one for PPC, I can just go and spend all the money and make sure I get that position. Whereas with SEO, there's a lot more into it, which we'll go into detail about, about understanding how to get on the first page of Google without having to spend money. Um, so, yeah, so that's how PPC works. So that's the top box. And PPC will always rank above SEO purely because it's paid for. That's it. That's cause, because Google likes to get paid. Um, and then the organic listing you can see straight after that is the first the first page ranking, which is an NHS page. NHS is quite an authoritative website, so you'll generally find for a lot of health um, search terms, NHS will rank above quite a lot of people. And I don't know if anyone's noticed, but you do also get questions depending on what you are Googling. Um, this is um, something, a new feature that Google released, I think around maybe three or four years ago. Um, and it's just some questions that they kind of collate within their database because like I said, um, searches are getting a lot more conversationalist now and Google are understanding that people are actually asking Google a lot of questions. So as you see, one of the questions there is what is meant by reduced fatal movement? Um, what causes decreased fatal movement and things like that. So um, I can, there is a slide on how to kind of appear within these search boxes, but it is at Google's discretion completely. Like there's no, there's no kind of right or wrong way to get into it but there are some things that you can do to manipulate the search term, the search engine, sorry, to get into that. And then you'll see underneath that, there is more organic search listing. So, um, so yeah, so this is how the search engine obviously looks, which I know you guys are aware of, but I just wanted to kind of break down what it looks like and what the different areas are in case you weren't aware. And I'll see some fun facts. So 50% of search queries are four words or longer, which obviously supports the conversational side of things. And Google is always going to be the champion search engine. Um, Believe it or not, Bing is also, um, I think, around 20% and the rest of the search engines are not very important. So there's a lot of considerations to kind of consider when you are trying to meet the user intent um, in terms of when you're optimizing your website and kind of the, the touch points that you'll go through or the processes that you'll go through to understand how to kind of give the user what you want from a um, search engine perspective. So that is anything between image optimizations, um, making sure that you are kind of coherent to the algorithms that Google updates do. If, you, if your website's content heavy, you maybe need a content hub or content seeding, um, making sure mobile journey, mobile journey is a lot more important than desktop, purely just because of the rise of how many people are using their phones as opposed to sitting at home on their laptops, apart from in lockdown. Um, but yeah, and then there's other areas in terms of how to structure your content. There's just loads of different touch points that you need to kind of understand that have the audience at the core. Um, and then within that you have content engagement and technical and those kind of seed off around each other. So the three main pillars of SEO, which we'll now go into in more detail. Um, technical is, I would say, the holy grail of making sure that you are in a good foundation to have an amazing website for SEO. Um, think of it like when you're building a house, it's, it's your bricks, basically. It's literally the, the structure of the house, making sure that everything is fine, making sure that there's a strong foundation for people to then to come and visit you, or in this sense, um, making sure that Google knows exactly how your website is built, what it's about from a structural perspective to be able to be indexed. And then the other aspects of on-page is making sure that the content is relevant. 
um if your website is selling clothes then make sure the only content you have on your site is about clothes don't have any random content that confuses google because google does read websites and if it sees something out of the ordinary it might think oh this doesn't make any sense and then it may just go somewhere else and find something better um and then for off page which is more kind of about just making sure that you're a reputable source of your content um this is anything from influencer engagements or social signals that are sent to your website or anyone just basically talking about your website and bigging you up in more of a general sense so we're going to technical seo now which is my favorite personally so within um technical seo there is a lot of different components to consider i just thought i'd give you a, this is actually a snapshot of a technical audit that i did for a client um and there's different aspects of how you build the website, but within that, there's a lot of aspects that Google will look at in terms of ensuring that you built it for SEO friendly purposes. So just to give you an example, I obviously won't go through all of the points, but URL structure, for example, is really important. So the main domain of your website will be whatever comes before the .com or .co.uk um, or .net or whatever domain you have. So just for argument's sake, selfridges.com, that would be the domain. Um, and then the structure after that, every time there's a forward slash, that actually stands for a subfolder. So um, the best way to describe it is if you think of subfolders as chapters of a book. So the domain will be the title of the book. And then the subfolders which come after the forward slash would be the chapter of each book. So you may have selfages.com forward slash women's forward slash dresses. So women's is one chapter and the dresses is another chapter. And then you may go down into midi dresses, bodycon dresses, and so forth and so forth but you have to make sure that you structure your website in a way where you want people to understand the user journey and the touch point so selfages.com would be the first the main the book title for example um and then depending on what they're looking for they may then want to go and look in the women's section and then within dresses and so you have to make sure that you structure your website in a logical way that it makes sense for the user whether they're already on your website or whether they've googled your website and they've landed on a particular url for example the url structure needs to be logical you can't have for example, selfages.com, dresses, dresses, then women's. Just, it just doesn't flow because Google, um, what it does, it, it prioritizes your subfolders based on priority. So what, whatever you think is the most important subfolder, you would have closest to the domain. Um, obviously you can have a, a number of different subfolders that are closer to the domain, but within the category data that I mentioned earlier, so women's would be in a category, men's, kids, and those so forth. So they would all be the closest to the domain separately. And then you would have all the subfolders after that. Um, if you have it in a jumbled way, like I said, Google just won't understand and it will understand, but it, it won't prioritize it in the way that you want it to be. So um, that's one aspect. Page speed is another really important one, um, kind of speaks for itself in the sense that the faster your website, the better from Google's perspective, especially now that they're a lot more in terms of kind of favoring the user. They want to make sure that they're giving the user journey the best possible journey they need to. And everyone's impatient now because, you know, the world is so instant. So if your website loads within three seconds, then great. Any slower than that, then Google's not your friend. Um, and then yeah, if you have error pages, it's not good because again, it's breaking down the user journey. So essentially all the technical aspects are just making sure that your website is sound and it works from a from an SEO perspective in terms of just not breaking the user's journey and also making sure that you're sound in terms of telling the um, search engine exactly what your website's about. So that's more the H1 tags and the types of tags, which we'll go into more detail about. Mm -hmm. So within that, if you have two pages that are the same, it's really confusing for the user and the search engine. So um, these, again, an example from Tommy's, they have the very similar URL um, and they have very similar content. So I don't know if you can spot the difference, but the only difference between these two URLs is the hyphen and zero at the end. Um, and the content is particularly the same. So if you have page duplication, what this kind of shows the search engine firstly is that you've got two pages, they're pretty much the same, so you're not really bothered about which one ranks. So in that sense, what Google will do is it may just choose to rank one over the other, and that kind of damages your SEO um, organic search visibility in the sense that you kind of want to have just one URL for one to, to rank once. You don't want to have the same content twice, um, because it, what it can do is if one's ranking, say one's ranking in week one, and then Google then recalls your website and then it comes back and thinks, oh, there's another one that's the same. Maybe let's just rank this one. Your, um, the fluctuations of how where you rank will be really up and down because it won't understand whether you care about this page or that page, but they're effectively the same. So it's just best, it's best to have really unique content um, just to make sure the um, search engine knows, okay, this, this page is literally just about how to remember the little girl who never breathed air and was never held. Um, 
and then because they'll say okay well this you really have this topic twice why do you have two two pages we just need to know one basically um and then i'll show you the effects of what happens is so yeah so like i was saying it, it lowers the authority of the page um which essentially confuses google it also confuses the user because they may the users don't notice as much as the search engines do but if the users do notice and it just kind of gives them a bit of a bad user journey and and it will just confuse them because it'll it'll they'll probably spend some time trying to work out the difference and they realize it's the same and they'll be like, well, what's the point of having two pages? Um, also affects conversion rate if you are selling things on your site in terms of, like I said, if one page is ranking one week and then another one is ranking, it, it fluctuates the performance and the rankings and it, it can affect your conversion rate in the sense of giving them some confusion. Um, it decreases the quality of the page. So I said, Google's all about quality and it, for, for your website, you should have, each, each page should be unique basically and kind of have its place. Um, and it does waste caller budget because every time you make a change on your website or if Google notices something about your site, the spiders will come back and call your site. And then if it sees that it's already seen this or it knows that it's already seen a similar page, it's just wasting budget because you want to you wanna make sure that your call budget is used for everything that you want Google to see, basically, not anything that you don't want Google to see. So ways you can actually minimize. Um, when you have duplication, it's actually called cannibalization of traffic, which basically means that um, if you have two pages that are the same, they'll cannibalize each, each other in the sense that they both take each other's traffic. Um, one of the main ways that you can fix this is by redirecting. So depending on what platforms your websites are built on, um, or whether some of you may have technical developers that can do this for you, um, you can redirect a, web, a redirect to URL, sorry. And all that means is you basically let Google know from a um, search engine perspective that this URL does exist. And this URL exists, but actually I only want one to exist. So you can redirect one of the duplicate pages to the other. Um, so there's two different redirects. You can have a permanent one, which is a 301, and a temporary one, which is a 302. Temporary ones are more so used, or I recommend my clients to use them if you have a sale, for example. So um, maybe Christmas. Christmas is obviously seasonal. It happens once a year. Um, and you may say that the Christmas page is obviously only live for a certain amount of time. So once it's down, you can then maybe redirect it to a holding page temporarily until next year. So Google knows that you still care about this page and hasn't permanently removed itself or permanently moved, sorry, but you want it to stay there, but you still want to kind of um, take away, take the organic search authority that's built up. Because once the URL is live and in Google's index, the longer it's live, the more authority it has. So if you want your, obviously you want your Christmas page to be quite important. So you'd want to tell Google that actually, yes, this happens once a year, every um once christmas is over we temporarily move it but then we bring it back um from a permanent perspective if you do have two duplicate pages and you just want to get rid of one then you would do a permanent redirect so you'd say yes i know there's two pages that are the same can we just permanently redirect one to the other and the longer the permanent redirect stays live the one that you've redirected will then drop out of the index so that will remove the cannibalization and it will remove the confusion and google will actually know yes there was two pages that were live there's now one and the other one doesn't count anymore um, a canonical, which is um, when I learned this word, I was like, why would they call it that? It's so complicated. Um, but a canonical tag is basically another way of telling Google how to kind of remove the confusion of the SERPs or remove any duplicate tags. So um, it basically tells them that this page is actually more important than the other. Um, so again, Selfridges is an example I'll use. They had a lot of pages that would kind of cross each other over. So for example, they would have women's um, bags and shoes within their women's category, but then they'd also have it under bags and shoes, but then for women. Um, so there was a lot of duplication in that sense. So what we would do is we would say, okay, well, what do you want to rank for? Do you want to rank for women's bags or do you want to rank for bags for women? So depending on the search term that you're going after, you would then say, actually, okay, well, if you want to rank for bags for women, we need to prioritize the bags category. So we would then put a canonical tag on the bags category URL to say, prioritize this one over the women's bag category. So it's just about kind of, um, it's a good analogy, just kind of sorting out your, your URLs in a sense to say, well, Google, I know there's a little bit of some confusion. It's a bit of a mess. We need both the URLs live, but if you can just look at it from a search engine perspective and prioritize this URL over that URL, it then again allows you to perform better um, to kind of clear up the confusion and the robot goes, okay, well, cool, you've got all these pages, but this is the only one we should care about. So let's just canonicalize this one, let's prioritize this one. Um, so that's our canonical tag work. So again, depending on what platform your website is built on or whether you guys have technical developers, um, I know a lot of people who have websites, they are doing it by themselves. So it's not easy to put all these technical components in place, but they are really good and best practice if you can learn how to do them or maybe get a technical developer to help you. 
And then the last one is the robots.txt file, which um, you can save it to your server and it basically kind of tells the search engine crawler what to do with your pages that you may want to disallow. Um, so if you have on-site search, for example, there's a lot of times where someone may come onto a website and search on-site. Um, and sometimes if you don't block them from your robots.txt, these pages can be indexed and they just look really messy. Like if you've ever been Googling, you see a really long URL with loads of like percentage signs or exclamation marks or stars or dots or brackets or whatever it is. It's just a really messy URL and it's not very um, search engine friendly. So you can tell Google to drop it out of the index. So this doesn't get rid of the pages on your website, but from a search engine perspective, again, it just cleans up a bit of the mess and kind of shows the robot don't actually look at this page because it's not important. It's important for the user once they're on my website, but I don't want them to see it before they get to my website, if that makes sense. So there's different um, rules that you can write within the robots.txt file to show the user or the search engine bot, sorry, what to allow. So within the image, you can see where you can say allow, disallow, um, or you can block certain user agents. So user agent is actually the different search bots that are from the search engine. So Bing has its own user agent, Google has its own user agent, Yahoo, ArcGIS, which is funnily still around. Don't know how he's still around. Um, so yeah, so moving on to broken pages. Broken pages is also quite bad from an SEO perspective. So I'm sure you've probably all been on a website and they say, oh, hey, this page is no longer here. Um, or this page is broken, or it kind of gives you an error. Um, from a search engine perspective, they would see that as a 404 code. Um, the longer you leave an error page up for your website, the more chances that Google will drop it out of the index because it's, it's seen as, okay, there's an error on this page. You haven't bothered to fix it. Um, you haven't bothered to give the user quite a good message about it either. So we're just going to forget about it basically, and it drops out of the index. Um, if you do have to have a 404 page, because sometimes it does happen, um, the best way to kind of keep it um, SEO friendly is to have a really nice message up to say, oh, hey, you you know, landed on a bad page, but maybe check out this. To kind of keep them on the page so it doesn't allow them to bounce off your website. Um, and yeah, they've seen that they have an error page, but you can navigate to somewhere else on the website. But there are ways that you can manage it, um, which is to put in a redirect. So for example, if you know the page is broken, um, the 301s and the 302s that I was just speaking about, you can put those in place. With, if you think the page is broken indefinitely, then I suggest you implement a 301, which is a permanent redirect. If the page is broken temporarily, maybe something you need to fix or you know, something's crashed because you know technology crashes all the time, you can temporarily redirect it somewhere else to say to Google, yes, I know this is broken, I'm gonna fix it, just you know, give me a little bit of a respite. So moving on to page speed, um, Google have very high expectations with how fast your website should be should be under three seconds load time. This includes everything from images to content, um, whether you've got fancy videos going on, wherever it might be. Wherever you have on your website, it needs to load within three seconds, otherwise Google's not really interested. Um, you can go from one to five seconds, but you can see how much of a, um, how much the probability of the bounce increases. So within one to three seconds, a bounce is basically when someone goes off the website. So basically people are very impatient especially in 2020, because everyone just wants everything fast. You can get everything on your phone now, um, even pet insurance, which is very interesting. Um, but yeah, you can, you need to make sure that your website is very fast in that sense. Um, if it's 10 seconds, then yeah, there's, there's not great. But there are ways that you can improve your page speed. Um, but I thought it'd be really good just to show you guys kind of the benchmark in terms of how many seconds or how fast your website does need to be from a Google perspective. This is not even from a user perspective. Um, obviously, some people do have patience, so they may wait for your website to load. But from a Google perspective, because Google is all about the user and giving the user what it wants, it needs to know that your page is, your page is fast, basically. So in terms of managing or kind of improving page speed, if you have a lot of images, if you haven't compressed them, um, I know obviously images need to are there to kind of make your website look good, depending on what your site is about. Um, but there are ways that you can press the sizes of the images, or there is a couple of tools or plugins that you can use to make them website friendly. So you can have a really good quality website, but just ensure that you kind of compress the image file or the size file, sorry, just to make sure that it doesn't take forever to load. Um, where you host your website is also quite important. So depending on what server you host, um, I know quite a lot of people may use WordPress. WordPress is actually quite good um, from a hosting perspective, but yeah, just ensure that your hosting is um, quite top notch and it doesn't include like a lot of server space in that sense. Because the, ironically, the larger server space you have, the slower your website can be just because the DNS, which is the 
domain name server will take a longer time to go around your server because it's quite big. So just ensure that you have a server um, or a hosting platform that kind of hosts the size of your website, basically, because there are different sizes to your website. Um, redirects, which we've touched on quite a lot, is just ensuring that if you do have some pages that you need to clean up, just clean them up so it doesn't take the page longer to load. JavaScript is just a technical term in terms of how to kind of code the back end of a website. Um, it was frowned upon from a Google perspective, but they seem to be getting a lot more open to it. They haven't explained why or how best to um, formulate it because Google don't want to help anyone that's in SEO. But JavaScript is something um, that I haven't put too much detail on, but if you guys do want some detail, we can um, have some questions later. Um, and then CSS and large files and plugins, widgets and apps are also another ways to manage the speed. But it's essentially just ensuring that you kind of compress your website if it's quite large or just put certain things in place just to make sure it, it moves a lot quicker. So moving on to metadata. So there's four aspects or four main aspects of metadata, uh, which is basically just some of the components that the search engine looks at from a back end perspective to understand more about your website. So Google can't call images. Um, so the only information you can give your give the search engine bots is any of the data that you have on your site. So that entails the content, but also actually how you kind of title your content. So looking at the bottom image, you can see the text that's in blue. That's actually what is called the title tag from a back end perspective. So the screenshot above um, where it says title, that would be where you put the title of the article in the summary. But um, again, depending on how your platform is kind of CMS it stands for, CMS is a content management system. Depending on how your CMS is built, um, you should have a section within the back end to, um, to put in the title tag that you need. So the title tag is quite important because when people are searching on Google, they see that. So that's the blue text. So they would look, when they're looking, when you kind of scroll through the search results, you obviously notice the title tag first and you think, oh yeah, that's what I'm looking for. If they've Googled, um, design addresses, for example. And if the, within the title tag, if it says design addresses, you kind of know you're on the, you're on the right track. Um, so yeah, it's really important to optimize your website in a way to put a title tag in place that you think that the user is gonna want to um, kind of see within the search results. How you do that is you do a lot of keyword research to understand the search volume behind whatever your page is about. So within this, this page is obviously about abdominal pain or cramps within pregnancy. Um, so you'd want to do some keyword research around that topic and find the best search term to then put into your um, title tag. And it's always best to have your brand name at the end. So that's where you can see Tommy. So at the end of all your title tags, depending on the nature of your website, it's always good just to have the brand name um, after the pipeline at the end. So Google knows that all of these pages refer to your brand, essentially. And then headings or H1 tags, they call them. You can have a million H tags if you want on your website, but H1 is the most important one. And that's the um, title of an article. So if your website is quite content heavy, um, you'll have a title on, you have a title tag, which is the title tag of the page, which we just, which we just went through. And the H1 tag will be the title on the actual page that you can see. So in that um, red box, um, if you're on a website, you can kind of see a title of the article or title of a page, depending on the nature of the website, but the H1 tag kind of gives Google another indication of what, okay, what is this page about? Um, Cause it does read all of your content, but these are the kind of the four strong signals that it will look for. Um, because if you imagine Google crawls a billion websites a day. Um, so it just needs to look at the main touch points of, okay, what's this page about? Cool, let's put this in this index. This is all about pregnancy. Let's put it over here. Um, make sure it appears within these search results so people search for a bucket of these keywords. Um, so, yeah, so the H1 tag is really important from the aspect of just telling Google, hey, this is exactly what all of this content on this page is about. So please consider us within this ranking database. And the message description, um, there's been a lot of debates within my colleagues about how important this is, but I personally still think it is quite important. It's not a ranking factor in the sense of it doesn't matter how many keywords you put within the meta, um, the meta description because Google doesn't rank you for that. But what it does do, and I don't know if you guys have noticed this, but when you do Google something, depending on what you search for, it will bold the text within um, the meta description of what you've searched for. So within this, if you search for stomach pains or cramps or any of the um, words that you can see in bold, it's because Google knows that you're looking for that. So it'll kind of highlight that, which will then show whoever's been searching, yeah, this page contains whatever search terms you've been searching for. So I personally still think it's quite important and it's really good to um, just make sure all of your meta descriptions are optimized to, it's kind of basically like a little bit of a blurb. So going back to the book analogy, just a little bit of a blurb about what each page is about um, that users can see within the search engine before clicking into the page. 
And then, as I mentioned, images can't be seen or can't be called by the robot. So if your website is really image heavy, we'll literally just see loads of blocks, blocks around the whatever they're calling and it won't see anything. So it's really important that you tag your images and give them alt text. So um, that screenshot's quite small, but where you can see the red box at the bottom, that just shows what title you've given the image. So search bots can call the image alt tags. So if you make sure that you, and you can be quite descriptive with the alt tags. So you can literally put like white, what is that? Periscope, telescope, whatever they're called. Um, so you can literally describe exactly what's in the image. Um, so you can tell exactly what the image is about. So it can have time to understand, okay, cool. You've got a picture on your site, can't see it, but you told me what it's about. So if someone searches within the image search, um, for an image about this, I know that I can potentially return them this because it's maybe what they're looking for. Um, and then I thought I'd give you a few fun facts about why image optimization is important. So 90% of Im information transmitted to the human brain is visual. Humans are very visual. Um, I know a lot of people like to visualize a lot of things. Um, so yeah, images are really important because I mean, some people don't even enjoy reading. So from an image perspective, it's always good to maybe visualize something. Um, and 27% of all searches across 10 major platforms are for images. Um, particularly nowadays, obviously, with the heavy use of social media and stuff, people are always looking for images to use to post or make a meme or whatever it is. So image optimization is really important. So um, within all of the technical kind of components that we just went through, there are tools that we use. So we don't do all of this manually. Um, there are some tools that we use. So I thought I'd kind of give you guys an idea. Of some, of the, some are free, some are paid for. Um, or they all have free versions, but you can get a better version of it if you um, pay for it, obviously. Um, so Screaming Frog is quite a good um, tool to use just when you're looking at um, the first slide that I went through in terms of looking at all the technical components. So if you want to know how good or bad is your URL structure, um, how fast or slow is your website, anything like that, Screaming Frog is quite good. Google Search Console is actually a free tool, so Google Earth can be nice sometimes. Um, and they could just tell you exactly what people are seeing um, from your website perspective from a search engine perspective, sorry. So they can see what search queries are driving people to your website. They can see how healthy your URLs are. Um, and yeah, so some of these tools I thought I'd recommend to you guys, um, depending on what you guys may, you may be aware of them, you may not be, but essentially it saves you a lot of time, um, gives you some really good insights, gives you some visuals, and it can give you a lot of data in bulk, which is kind of what you need to understand your audience. And then looking at structured data. So structured data is what you would put in place, particularly if you want to um, rank in the people, people ask questions box. So the, the one that we went through on the slide of the search engine results page. So the more organized you um, organize your data, the more chance you have of being um, ranked in a featured snippet. So you can kind of see the different, the three kind of examples of structured data. So standard structured data, you can see um, where it's got the text in green on the first um, screenshot that just kind of structures your internal links that you have on your site. And then if you have a website that's kind of got reviews um, or recipes, then that would also appear. And then if you, um, rich cards is also another way that will start pulling images and pulling reviews and then pulling everything. So the more um, organized you put your data on your site, the more, um, the more organized it will look within Google and the more use, e easier it is for the user, sorry. Knowledge graph is also another way that you can um, kind of get your information on Google. So I don't know if you guys have noticed this, but you may Google brand names or celebrities or whoever they are, and then it can pull in a lot of information about them. Normally the Wikipedia page, which gets pulled in automatically, but if you have social, um, social handles that are within your brand or for your website, you can um, implement structured data to then pull them in. So it kind of has this nice little summary of, you know, what your brand is about and then all the different profiles so people can find you. And then, yeah, search engine just basically state that they're able to understand the context um, and intent of your page better if you include strong structured data. And how you implement structured data um, is through a tool called Schema. So Schema Markup, which is partly, a lot of it's done through the back end, but there are some tools um, that I can share after this just to understand how better to implement the structured data. And voice search, which has become a lot um, more popular, I would say, within the past maybe two or three years, because um, again, people just want things quickly. So there's still no right or wrong way to optimize for voice search, but within structured data, it has been seen that the more structured data you have, the more organized data that you have on your site, um, and the more you optimize it for maybe conversational pieces, the more likely you are to rank within voice search. So 
if you say, hey Alexa, find me the best dress to wear to a nightclub or whatever. Um, depending on how well you structured your data, you probably have a better chance of um, ranking within the voice search. But yeah, Google are being quite um, closed about how exactly to nail the voice search in area. But there have been some, we've done quite a lot of testing learns with clients and we've seen some voice search results that they don't last forever. Sometimes they last maybe two or three weeks, but it's good when you win them and we just hold on to it and then tell the other clients that we know how to do voice search. Um, so moving on to on-page content. Um, so yeah, so within on-page content, there's quite a lot of um, different components that you need to kind of look into or factors. So metadata, which is what we went through before, is just about ensuring that you optimize it to include your brand name, um, as I mentioned before, include any keywords that you're trying to appear for, um, avoiding duplication, and Google actually do have some character limits in place. So page titles, so title tags, which is what I showed you appears on the um, on the search result page in blue text, they have to be under 60, 60 characters, otherwise they get truncated off. Um, and it's not the worst thing, but um, yeah, Google do frown upon it in the sense that obviously people can't see the whole title, so they don't know exactly all of what it's about. Um, and it just doesn't look great, to be honest. Um, and the same with the meta description. Last year, Google did actually expand the character um, limit for meta descriptions to 500 and then changed its mind, which is annoying because we then told all of our clients, oh, hey, we can actually expand all the metadata lasted about three months and then you had to change all that. So that's what I mean in terms of Google updating its algorithm quite a lot of times. So you have to kind of stay on top of understanding exactly, okay, what do Google want to do today? Because I just think people who work at Google get bored to be honest and they just play around with stuff and think, oh, let's just, you know, change this ranking factor and see what happens. Um, so yeah, the structure of the URL, which um, I kind of went through before, just making sure that you kind of denote the site hierarchy that you want. So you'll see homepage, category pages, subcategory pages and so forth. Um, the format is really important in terms of depending again the nature of your website. Um, do you want people to read a paragraph, a list, a table, a QA, and a depending on what the content of your site is about. So just making sure that you format your website in a way that you want it to be known for. Um, and the content is really key. Um, the more content you have the better on a page now. Never used to be that way but again Google are all about the user now so have a minimum of around 300 words. Um, and just include all the keywords that you kind of want to be known for, or at least the content that you know your website is about. Assets to your page as well is really important. So that could be pictures, videos, um, if you want to give away downloads, like a PDF or whatever it is, just making sure again that your assets are optimized. Um, images, like I said, need an image alt text or alt tag to tell the um, search engine what it's about. Same with videos, um, same with all of them to be honest, they all need to be labeled so Google understands what it is. And then the navigation. So I don't know if you guys have noticed this, but if you're on a website and you may be looking at a blog, for example, and there's a really nice long article and then you kind of get to the end of the article and then that's it. Um, it's really good to have ways where you can kind of interlink your um, pages. So if you have a blog article about pregnancy, then within that you may have something within breastfeeding and then you would have an internal link on that particular keyword to breastfeeding. So someone can then click in and go into breastfeeding. Um, it's really quite good and kind of gives the um, search engine kind of another social, not social, ranking signal, sorry, um, to understand exactly how authoritative you want that page to be. Um, and again, it just kind of keeps the user on the page and um, gives them a better user journey if they want to read more about what content you have to offer, basically. So this kind of shows, um, with all the components that I was just speaking about, where they would be best placed on the site. So you can see where the H1 tag is, which I showed you previously, um, is kind of the top part of the article. Um, you can have, like I said before, a different number of header tags. So H2 tag will come after the H1. So you can kind of see it goes in um, in sync in terms of H1 will be first and then the H2. But you have to ensure that you code the H1 and the H2 as two different tags. Because if you have two H1s, then Google will think, okay, you've got two H1s, which one do you prioritize? H1 is the most important. Um, so you can see the H2s underneath that are in smaller font. And then obviously the format, um, the copy is really important, the internal links. Um, so yeah, so this is just kind of just showing you or visualizing exactly how all of these components come together um, and what Google looks at. And then you can see in the top left, the search engine result, which is where the page title and the meta description is pulled through. So moving off to offsite. Oh, come on. So um, understanding the landscape in terms of offsite. So offsite SEO, just to give you a bit of a background is basically 
any um, backlink that you have pointing to your website. So as I was mentioning before, it's kind of like a bit of a popularity contest. The most popular person has the most friends. Um, so the most popular website will have a lot of backlinks pointing back to its website. So um, in order for us to understand that, what we do is we use a number of tools. So these are some of the tools. Again, some are free, some are paid for. Paid version is always best. Um, but from the auditing perspective, you kind of understand the size and the challenge and the opportunity. So if you have a website and you don't have many backlinks, for example, you can use one of these sites just to understand what type of backlinks you do have, because there are some quality backlinks. So um, if your website is, you know, a blog, if you get a lot of backlinks from publications, so Huffington Post or, um, I don't know, Vogue or whoever it is, they're really good authoritative sites to get a link back from if your website is about anything that their content is related to. So these tools just kind of give you an idea um, of what type of backlinks you have, how many you have. And then within that, we can look at different areas um, that I've listed in the text. So whether it's spammy domains, um, site-wide links. Site-wide links are basically a link that you will get that may be pointing to more than one um, page on your site. So it's site-wide in that sense. So you may have um, a backlink pointing to kids page or women's page or whatever it may be. And then from an ideation perspective, um, you just look at kind of understanding, okay, cool, this is where I'm at with my backlink profile. How do I kind of build on this? Um, so you kind of look at your competitors, see where your competitors have linked from, content that competitors have links to, so you can kind of understand, well, actually, they're kind of similar to me. They've got links to this page, so then, you know, you can kind of understand what type of backlink you can, um, you can earn. But backlinks are really important in terms of um, improving your SEO performance and understanding exactly, or telling Google, sorry, or any search en engine, I've got a page about this and even people are kind of kind of like giving somebody kudos so they may think your page is really good and yeah they're going to give you a link back to it so that shows the google that oh, actually yeah this page is really good because even someone else thinks it's good because they're linking back to it basically so just um to follow on from that is basically when when you do off-site marketing it's called outreach um and there's four kind of different areas of outreach so you can have link reclamation which is where you earn it um, and you earn this um, naturally. So you may just have a really great website, with really great content, and people may just decide, oh, actually, this is really amazing. I'm going to link back to this, so I'm going to share this. So that's one way. So that's why I always say it's really important to have a really top quality website with really great content in whatever area you're writing it about. It can be something as boring as buttons, but it can be the best article on buttons ever. Um, or it can be a really great magazine about fashion or whatever it is. Whatever it is, you just need to make sure that your content is really great. So you can kind of put yourself in the best possible position to have a link back to your website. Um, and then content marketing is another way to also earn links naturally, but you kind of go the extra mile, make it really engaging, really unique, uh, make it data led. So there's a, um, there's a tool that we use to kind of understand shopping habits. So we can make it really, really data led. So we normally maybe do a survey, for example, um, just take an example I did today for skincare. So simple of one of my clients and we did a really good, um, study on skincare and actually we've noticed that during lockdown obviously a lot more people are going more into skincare because they have time um so we did a really good survey in terms of understanding what people were looking for so there was search terms around like um skincare for dry skin oily skin dull skin um anything like that so it's a lot more data led so we took all of that data and then made a really really um what well, we briefed them to create a really um kind of really sexy looking content piece so then we hope that people would then link to it. So it's more like content marketing in the sense that we put some data behind it. So we know that it's out there from a search trend perspective, because we have tools to understand what the search volume is for a particular search term. Um, so then we know that actually, yeah, people are really looking into this now. This is the right time to do it. Let's see this content out there and hope that people will um, link back to it. So these two types of outreach are free, which is great. So you'll love freebie. Um, but yeah, the data-led research sometimes can cost a bit of money just in terms of depending on what data tools that you have. But it's a really good way to understand and actually see some content out there and get your backlink profile up. And then the other two aspects are blog outreach and sponsored posts. So blog outreach is where you would um, reach out to a blogger and just basically ask them to link back to your page and either gift them with products if you have products or pay them for a post, basically. Um, and bloggers are quite cheeky, especially if they know that their site is really authoritative from a Google perspective, because when you get a backlink from Google, you kind of want a backlink that has the most quality. So if there's this thing called domain authority, so the higher number DA that a blogger has, the more likely they're going to charge. So just for an example, a really good DA would be maybe 48. Um, Google doesn't even explain what these numbers mean, but the higher the number, the better, basically. 
Um, so yeah, so if a blogger has a um, DA of 48, they can probably charge you quite a lot of money for a backlink. But essentially, it does look really well, um, particularly if you are within e-commerce or even if you are a blogger yourself, um, kind of do paid partnerships or, you know, you might have, I don't know, if you have a natural hair brand, for example, and you may gift them out some natural hair products for them to link back. Um, so they may get some free products and you may pay them quite a good fee but essentially you're improving the um authority of your website so you're improving your performance which in tell obviously all of this is all about revenue at the end of the day um or traffic if you don't sell anything on your site so you would look at that and then understand okay well what's my roi on this so if you pay 200 pound for a link for example but then you sell loads of products for the next six months it's kind of worth it so you have to kind of understand the value behind blogger outreach but that's another way to do it um and then sponsored posts are more so what you would do on social media so whether that's Instagram, Facebook, um, you can just put out some posts around, obviously have a link back to your website and then put some budget behind it and push those out there. So, so yeah, these are kind of the ways that you can outreach, but they are really important. But the reason why I went through it in this way is because technical is the first thing that you need to kind of put in place and then the content and then the out outreach is kind of the amplification of everything that you've done on the site. So in summary, Show you my nice little pack line. Is it going to work? Yes, it is. Wonderful. Um, so yeah, so in summary, um, just to kind of sum up in terms of all of those three components, Google have recently released um, EAT, we call it EAT, um, which basically looks at three different components of your website and that basically gives them or helps them decide how best you are to be ranked within the search engine, basically. So expertise looks at how in-depth is your content, how targeted is it, and how semantically appropriate is it for the content that you're trying to um, appear for so like i said your website can be about absolutely anything but just make sure you are the expert within whatever field of your website it, it is um, and then the authority which we were just talking about in terms of external links just making sure that other websites are giving you that kudos are giving you that um, votes of confidence per se and just saying yeah actually the site is really great it's about buttons but it's amazing and you know they've got great lo loads of content around buttons um, and then trust just making sure that your site is secure so then if you guys notice when you go on websites, it can either say HTTP or HTTPS. So HTTPS is the secure way. Um, everyone's website should be on HTTPS now, but a lot many people have been on that. Um, particularly if you sell stuff on site, because you need to obviously give your customers or your users trust that, you know, your credit card or your debit card details aren't going to be spread across the whole world, world wide web or anything like that. So just making sure that it's secure, they have a safe way to pay, um, and you can't really, you know, can't be open to any viruses or anything like that. So, so yeah, just so in a nutshell, EAT is kind of all of the, kind of ties into all of the aspects that we just looked at. And just five key takeaways to give you guys, um, kind of key points. Um, so the landscape for whatever you're trying to achieve with your website is really important. So understanding the search demand and the search intent. Um, technical, just making sure that there's no technical issues on your website and your site is technically built from a foundation perspective to improve accessibility and just to improve to make sure that the search engine can understand exactly what your website is about. And user experience is really important. Page speed is probably one of the most important aspects of user experience, but that user experience, which we didn't touch too much on, also is important from a navigation perspective. So once someone is on your website, how easy is it to navigate around your website? How easy is it to find things? Um, you need to make sure you keep your users engaged, basically. And the content strategy is also important in the sense of you need to obviously make sure you optimize for whatever you're trying to um, appear for. So making sure that you have keywords that are relevant to whatever your content is about and making sure you do keep your content up to date. So putting new content on the site and making sure it's relevant to your brand. And then the, the marketing aspect of it, just obviously making sure that you are earning links, whether you are making amazing content or whether you're getting links, paying for links or earning them um, naturally.